a brave captain against a seemingly impregnable naval base that withheld targets of great value. This is the story of the Bull of Scapa Flow. Heinrich Ginter Prien was born in the city of Osterfeld, in German Saxony, on January 16, 1908. He was the firstborn of Gustav Prien, a judge in the local district, and his wife, Margaret Schauk, an artist. Ginter, along with his two younger sisters, lived with their parents in Hanover and Lübeck, but in the early 1920s the couple separated, and the children moved in with their mother in Leipzig. Losing all of the wealthy financial condition provided by Gustav, Margaret found herself in serious difficulty to support the children, starting to work as a clothing saleswoman. She remarried, but the old standard of living was never restored. In 1922, at age 14, Ginte Prin dropped out of school to work as a delivery boy and help pay the family bills. In the following year, he was able to join the Handelsflotte, the German merchant marine, attending the seaman school in Hamburg. The young Prin was already extremely determined and oriented to climb the steps of the naval career since his early years at sea. His first post was as a cabin boy on a small sailboat, and after eight arduous years of experience, he passed the exams to become the fourth officer on board of the ocean liner Hamburg. During this period, he became proficient in telegraphy, ship management, leadership and maritime law, becoming first officer in 1931. In January 1932, Print finally achieved his great goal, and at just 24 years of age, he obtained his captain's certificate, being qualified to command merchant ships. However, the long-lived and terrible effects of the financial crisis of 1929 were already severely affecting the German naval sector, and Print found himself without a job, being passed over in favor of captains with more command experience. With no options and no money, he ended up joining a popular work front, and in the following months he supported himself in civil construction, draining fields and digging channels, until, at the end of that year, a tremendous opportunity appeared in front of him. The Reichsmarine, the small navy of the Weimar Republic, had opened officer candidate programs for officers of the Merchant Navy. Passing the exams, Brin was admitted to the Reichsmarine on January 16, 1933, being seven years older than most of his colleagues. He received basic military training at Stralsund Naval Base on the Baltic Sea, being officially made Fenrich zur Sea or Naval Cadet on March 1st. After almost two years in training, on October 1, 1934, Cadet Print took up a post on the bridge of the light cruiser Konigsberg, and in this role he was promoted Lieutenant zur Sea, or Second Lieutenant, on April 1, 1935. In October of that year he entered the submarine school in Kiel, graduating in April 1936 and becoming watch officer in the U-26 submarine, serving under the command of Captain Lieutenant Werner Hartmann. At the beginning of the following year, U-26 was sent for service to the Spanish Civil War, where Prin gained valuable experience in real combat conditions, and in October 1937 he was summoned to Kiel shipyards to take part in the design and construction of the new submarine Type 7B U-47, which would become his first command. Weighing 850 tons, the new submarine had a length of 66.5 meters and a crew of 60 men. It was propelled by two diesel and two electric engines, which generated a speed of 19 km per hour on the surface and 7.5 km per hour submerged, being armed with five torpedo tubes, four forward and one in the rear, as well as an 88mm cannon on the deck. The U-47 was commissioned in the Kriegsmarine on December 17, 1938, and the proud Ginta Prien was promoted Captain Lieutenant or Captain on February 1, 1939. That same year he married his bride Ingeborg, and the couple had two children. Anxious to finally launch his boat into the Atlantic, an unsuspecting Captain Prince sailed from Kiel with the U-47 on August 19, 1939, leaving behind a continent he would never see in peace again. On September 1st, World War II broke out with the German invasion of Poland, which caused France and the British Empire to declare war on the Third Reich. By radio, Print received the news of the outbreak of the war in the middle of the ocean, with orders to begin offensive operations against the enemy shipping. On the 5th, 
northwest of Spain, he spotted the 2,400-ton British freighter Bosnia, which had set sail from Sicily carrying 3,200 tons of sulfur to the UK. Brin emerged at the side of the ship and fired a warning shot with the deck gun, demanding the surrender. When the British captain ordered an evasive maneuver, Brin opened fire with the cannon, hitting the ship six times, starting a fire in its sulfur load. The crew then surrendered and was transferred to a passing Norwegian ship, and Prince sank the Bosnia with a torpedo. In the next 48 hours, he took two more British freighters to the bottom, returning to port on September 15 with 8,270 tons sunk by his boat, for which he was awarded the Iron Cross second class. On October 1st, the newly promoted counter-admiral Karl Dennitz took over his new command, becoming Befelshabede unter Sibute, or commander of the submarines, then enjoying almost complete operational freedom to implement his Wolfpack tactics, or groups of submarines, for attacks against the enemy merchant convoys. Aware that the huge disparity in numbers between the Kriegsmarine and the Royal Navy prevented a direct confrontation between the two forces, then it strongly defended the thesis that the German Navy should concentrate its funds on the construction of submarines, in order to suffocate the United Kingdom to a massive sinking campaign of its merchant ships. But an event that took place in the previous month opened his mind to other possibilities. On September 17, at the Irish coast, the British aircraft carrier HMS Courageous was on patrol, escorted by four destroyers, and early in that evening, without any suspicion, it began to be silently followed by Captain Lieutenant Otto Schuhart's submarine, the U-29. After two hours of pursuit, Courageous maneuvered into the wind to launch its aircraft, which incidentally exposed the ship's entire flank to the submarine's bow. Schuhart then fired three torpedoes at the Courageous, scoring two direct hits and making the huge ship sink in 20 minutes. This impressive action made Karl Dönitz realize how vulnerable large ships were to attack by submarines, and with that he resurrected an old idea. For a long time I had in my mind the idea of an operation against Scapaflow. I knew, of course, of the failures of the two attempts made in the previous war by Captains von Hennig and Emsmann, and of the great difficulties involved from the point of view of navigation. In the light of that, an operation against Scapa Flow sounded like the most daring of all daring plans. The naval base of Scapa Flow, located in the Orkney Islands in northern Scotland, was the main anchorage for the Royal Navy surface fleet. A body of water naturally protected by several portions of land, its interior was accessed only by straits, which were protected by immense anti-submarine and anti-torpedo nets, making it virtually impossible for the enemy to access the fleet inside. However, Dunnitz insisted on finding a flaw in those defenses. Aerial reconnaissance photos taken by a Luftwaffe aircraft gave the Admiral his answer. The shallow eastern accesses, to the north and south of Lambholm Island, contained no nets and were only obstructed by blocking ships. While the southern passage was entirely blocked by two large ships, the northern passage had a 16-meter gap between the vessels, enough for a submarine to cross. Despite the extremely high risks involved, Dunitz considered that the prize would be magnificent and gave the green light to the operation selecting the experienced Captain Ginter Prin for the main role. Enthusiastic about the responsibility he had received, Prin tirelessly studied the routes and maps of Scapa Flow in the days leading up to his departure, and left Kiel with the U-47 on October 8, still without informing his crew of the true nature of the mission. To avoid any detection, Prin would move only at night, leaving the submarine stationary on the seabed during the day, finally approaching Scapa Flow on October 13. Emerging around 8 p.m., Prin was shocked to find the evening unexpectedly lit by the Northern Lights, which could potentially put the entire operation in jeopardy. However, he decided to move on, following a ship that was heading for the port. At 10 p.m., the navigation lights of Scapa Flow were turned on, and Prin was able to correct his course, approaching the port entrance at midnight on October 14. Soon the U-47 found itself driven inward by a strong current, and the submarine ended up momentarily stranded, only breaking free after reversing the engines at maximum power. Due to the extremely shallow waters of the straits, Prin had to try the crossing at the surface, keeping a nervous observation in the tower, looking for movement on land. To his relief, there were no lookouts in the area. 
Silently, the U-47 passed through the narrow gap between the blocking ships, in careful navigation to avoid any collision, as the submarine was being pushed in by the current. After a few tense moments, the aft of the U-47 got rid of the passage, and at 27 past midnight, Brin enthusiastically announced, Viz in Scapa Flow, or We Are in Scapa Flow. The U-47 had become the first enemy vessel in history to overcome the base barriers. Heading southwest, Brin and his officers in the conning tower scanned the dark horizon for targets, but after 15 minutes without seeing anything, he decided to make a U-turn to the northeast. That was when one of the watchmen announced that he had seen the silhouette of a large ship 4,000 meters away. The other officers, with their binoculars, also sighted the target, quickly identifying it as a Revenge-class battleship, with another ship partially hidden behind it, which was initially identified as another battleship. With precise identification of the first target, the Germans had before them the 30,000-ton battleship HMS Royal Oak, armed with four 381mm double turrets, a participant of the Battle of Jutland in the First World War, and which had just returned from a patrol in the North Sea. Behind it was not a second battleship, but the seaplane tender HMS Pegasus. Faced with such a favorable opportunity, while still being entirely unnoticed by the British, Prin immediately gave orders to attack, and his four frontal firing tubes were loaded. At 058, he ordered fire with his four torpedo tubes, but the excitement of the moment was entirely frustrated. Two of the torpedoes simply disappeared, and a third one hit the bowl of the Royal Oak, breaking the anchor chain, which began to strike like a bell against the hole. Many sailors were awakened, but the distant explosion seemed more like an accident than an enemy attack, and many went back to sleep. The fourth and last torpedo didn't even come out of the firing tube, getting stuck inside. The G7E torpedo, which had entered service in the Kriegsmarine in 1936, was an extremely problematic device and prone to failures in the magnetic and impact fuses, as well as in the buoyancy controls. Enraged, Prin ordered a half turn and fired a fifth torpedo with the stern tube, and to his horror, he saw it also disappear without a trace. However, Ginter Prin would not give up, and while ordering a new turn in the direction of the target, he went down to the torpedo room to personally check the new devices for a second attack. Then, at 1.13 am, he fired a second volley of three torpedoes, following its progress in the water with his hands nervously gripping the periscope until, at 1.16, with wide eyes, he saw three large explosions in rapid succession on the side of the Royal Oak. The explosions opened holes in the armored decks, destroying several compartments of the crew and causing the loss of electricity. One of the ammunition magazines exploded, causing an uncontrollable fire that quickly spread across the ship which also began to list heavily to starboard. The sudden flash alerted the entire port, and quickly a group of destroyers was already on their way to the scene to look for the raider. After confirming his success, Brin knew that he should get out of there as soon as possible, and ordered the evacuation. Immediately, the U-47 turned around in a southeast direction, incredibly managing to get out unscattered the same way it had entered. As the U-47 moved away, the Royal Oak rode until it was on its side, remaining so for a few minutes, until it disappeared below the surface at 1.29, just 13 minutes after the attack. 835 crewmen lost their lives in the rapid sinking, while another 424 managed to be saved by rescue. The next morning, the British found one of the used torpedoes, confirming the identity of the attacker. The BBC broadcast news of the attack that morning, and the broadcast was picked up in Germany and by U-47 itself, which was already sailing back home, Admiral Dunitz remembered. Brin accomplished his mission with great boldness, tremendous efficiency and exemplary judgment. It was obvious that after such success, the British would examine every possible entry route into Scapa Flow and seal everything before their fleet could be considered safe again. While Winston Churchill, then First Lord of the Admiralty, went to the Parliament in London and described the sinking of the Royal Oak as an extraordinary feat of professionalism and daring, at 11.44 am on October 17, the U-47 arrived at Wilhelmshaven, where the crew was greeted with an effusive welcome of heroes. Breen was awarded the first class of the Iron Cross, and the entire crew received the second class. 
Hitler sent his two four-engine Focke-Wulf Condors to pick up the crew and bring them to Berlin. And upon arriving in the capital of the Reich the next day, Brin and his sailors were greeted by enthusiastic crowds on the streets. Welcomed at the Chancellery, the crew members were individually greeted by Adolf Hitler, who then decorated Ginter Prin with the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross, making him the first submarine commander to receive the award. Made a national hero by the Ministry of Propaganda in the following weeks, Prin earned the nickname Der Stier von Schapaflo, or the Bull of Schapaflo, and the emblem of a bull was painted on the conning tower of his submarine, a symbol later adopted throughout the 7th Flotilla. Engelbert Endras, his watch officer on that mission explained the reason for the nickname. During the attack, he was held in tight to the periscope, with his arched back, heavy breathing and a nervous wrinkled face, which reminded us of a bull in the arena. Already on November 16, Prince set out for his third patrol, the last of that year, in which he sank three ships despite recurring failures in the G7E torpedoes, returning to port on December 18. The following year he received a new watch officer, Oberleutnant Suze Hans van Akhaus, future commander of the submarine U-199, and with him began a sequence of successful patrols in the Atlantic, leading numerous wolf packs and engaging several enemy convoys. On October 20, 1940, he spotted the large convoy HX-79 east of the UK and signaled its position to the Wolfpack. Prince sank three freighters that day, and with his guidance, the other submarines sank nine more ships. For these actions, Ginter Prin became the fifth soldier of the Wehrmacht to be awarded the oak leaves for the Knight's Cross. Departing on his 10th patrol on February 20, 1941, in the following days he successfully reported the sinking of five more ships. However, on March 7, while chasing a convoy northwest of Scotland, the U-47 sent its last transmission. Shortly after midnight on March 8, his boat was sighted by escorting vessels and a chase was initiated to destroy it. Destroyers HMS Wolverine and Verity took turns attacking the submarine, launching depth charges throughout the night, until at 5.19 am the U-47 was spotted on the surface and failed to dive deep enough to escape the next attack. The Wolverine dropped its charges on the submarine, and a few seconds later the British sailors saw the detonations, with the U-47 exploding in a large orange flash visible from the surface. Posthumously promoted to Corvette and Capitaine, Ginter Prin had at the time of his death, at 33 years of age, a score of 31 sunken ships, a grand total of 191,919 tons. Fearing the negative impact of the news on the morale of the nation, the German government did not report the death of its hero until May 23rd when they finally published it in the newspapers, hidden amid the euphoric headlines about major sinkings in the Atlantic. Hey there, I'm glad you followed the video to the end. If you enjoyed this content, please consider subscribing. This channel will have new content for you every week, and I promise you, you will enjoy the next ones.